But yeah, let's uh, jump into it. First of all, I just want to say, uh, Colby, we had you on before. I really appreciate you coming back and, you know, just sharing your story. But yeah, I kind of, I just love to hear about your experience with GA. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure. Um, your content is a big part of why I decided to get into becoming a developer in the first place. So yeah, man, as always, I, I appreciate you having me on and uh, yeah, thanks for doing what you do. This is this is good stuff you're bringing to, to the public. So let me just open it by by saying that appreciate um it. yeah so i'm i i was like you said i was on here previously um we we were talking about the subject of that video was basically talking about how i could make the most of my coding bootcamp experience i'm wearing the same uh sweater as i was last time i got my nice on the developer certified uh sweater on but um yeah i'll just jump into it by kind of going through the experience that i had um i i landed on ga primarily because of you know their PR. They have a relatively solid um, front end. Uh, their their marketing department has done a really good job. I want to make it clear: I'm not here to directly disparage GA or the idea of attending a coding boot camp in general. Um, I'm I'm basically here to talk as objectively as I can about my experience and hopefully speak up for um, people who ultimately can't as a result of what I'll dive into now. So um, excuse me for being slightly choppy, but I'm just going to pull my notes up here. So the experience in, at General Assembly started out fine. Uh, I didn't really have any complaints going into the first couple of weeks. Um, starting a couple of days into week one, there were some minor red flags that started popping, uh, like showing up. Um, that I think we're only really recognized in hindsight. So the biggest one, like all of this started manifesting from the TA that we had at GA from like day two or three, he had his camera off for the majority of the class sessions, which is like, you know, say what you will. It's fine. I'm not, I'm not worried about it. GA does have an expectation that as students, you are expected to have your camera on and be participating at uh you know basically at all times and um but i get it like people have bad days uh bad hair days forgot to their makeup uh they're stressed uh they just stopped crying whatever um so there's reasons you can you know have your camera off that are perfectly reasonable for for an hour or even a day um by but in my estimation um but two days turned into three weeks of not seeing rta's face he was logged in the whole time but we just never saw him and uh with that came a complete lack of participation in terms of helping people as well so um yeah that's when it started bugging me and some other people as well i brought it up kind of informally to our our lead instructor right before unit one ended which was you know a month four or five weeks in something like that um but it really started bugging people when unit two came around because there were people that were falling behind and they needed help and they weren't getting it and um, they weren't being properly evaluated to tell uh, if they even needed that help in the first place. So I decided to bring it up to my student success manager, which if anyone listening doesn't know is part of the structure that GA and a lot of boot camps have, they'll have a rep that's you know supposed to represent be a liaison between representing ga and representing you to make sure that you're getting an optimal learning experience um and we didn't really get answers from that and so by basically by by luck i can tell you about it but um basically by luck i was able to escalate it to the the manager of students um she happened to pop in to our unit one project overviews for like a minute or two to make sure it was going okay and i looked her up on linkedin it was private but i i i'm not a stalker i swear but i opened her resume i, I found her portfolio on there and there was an email link the email link was like not working but i inspected the element and found her email uh in the in the uh not the columns the uh, elements panel of all things and um that was that was a whole story in and of itself that i mostly just told but we had an initial meeting with our student success rep and her to talk about the issue and we scheduled a follow-up and she ended up like two weeks later not even showing up to that meeting uh so that was very bothersome 
Shortly after that, our TA was excused from our cohort and he was replaced. By then, though, um, you know, the damage was kind of already done in terms of not evaluating people's progress in a diligent way uh, and making sure that they were keeping up. So we kind of got to this point where um, I, myself and, an, and a couple of other students were doing okay, but it kind of got to this point of like opportunity cost might be the right term where it's like, okay, if I stay, it's going to be like one or two people carrying the weight of a lot of the other students that have fallen behind because they haven't been properly attended to in the project phase of things. And for me, that was a big reason why I joined a coding bootcamp in the first place was to produce high quality projects with people that were beginners, mind you, but also had a relatively decent understanding of what we were learning and could actually contribute. But for reasons that I just went over that, that wasn't the case. Um, so that, that was the overall experience. Um, I can get into like dropping and what happened after that, the part that particularly annoys you now, if you'd like. Um, that annoys me? Uh, yeah, the the contract side of things. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so how far did you make it before you did drop? We were nearing the end of unit two. So GA splits up their coding boot camps into four different units. First one is front end, second is back end, and then they have two full stack uh, modules. Um, so we were, we had just started back end projects. So I believe that would put us at week number eight, I want to okay. say. Something like that. Gotcha. And so, what is the role of the instructors for making sure everyone's on track? Because I feel like that's not really a TA's job in a lot of coding boot camps. So were they absent with that? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the typical standard is to, it varies from boot camp to boot camp, obviously, but I'm um, the, the bare minimum standard is homework. So, at uh, you know, at a at a coding bootcamp, at least with GA, you're assigned homework projects or tasks to complete that demonstrate that you have an understanding of the material, and those just weren't followed up on. So, I mean, we'd gotten halfway through the back end unit, and I haven't received feedback for uh, homework that I had done related to HTML or CSS. So, th there was no follow up with homework evaluations to determine whether or not a student was keeping up or wasn't which allowed students that were not keeping up to kind of get get by and and not meet the the standard the, like the learning standards without yeah basically not not hold them accountable and like in a more benevolent way to to help them potentially um you know catch up via office hours and stuff like that um does GA have periodic assessments tests to make it through the, to the next section? The assessments are pr primarily homework based and then the, um, they they grade the projects as well. So that's that's how GA does the, uh, the that as far as my understanding goes that's that's at least that's how they did it with our cohort. It was uh, mainly the demonstrated understanding was communicated through or was supposed to be communicated through completion of the homework assignments and so the actual assessments um not just the homework assignments like specifically but the actual official assessments of the coding boot camp were not graded or checked or given feedback i didn't receive we didn't receive any formal assessments other than homework and like project evaluations okay um you you did get project evaluations though Sure. I mean, we had a presentation day for our projects, but um, I, I would not say no, I, we never received any rubric like grading our projects or giving any formalized feedback. It was all very informal and was done for a minute or two after the project presentation. What kind of feedback did you receive? Very superficial, not, uh, not, not not very critical in any way uh, it, was, it was it was very it was very minimal don can you give me an example literally that was interesting um 
here's what I thought about your styling on this button or something like that. And, and moving on, I mean, extremely like to call it feedback is quite generous. So they, they didn't really get into any technical feedback. There was very, there was there, there, I'm being too generous with the feedback thing. There really was no feedback loop in terms of like how we were completing homework or evaluations from a technical standpoint. And who was responsible for that feedback instructors or TAs? Uh, that's a good question because the lack of it kind of left me with a lack of understanding. Um, my understand by my understanding, I would say that, uh, the TA would pick up on, on things like the homework assignments probably, and then escalate any questions that they had to the lead instructor. Uh, and then probably the projects would be primarily evaluated by the lead. Uh, but that is almost entirely speculation. Okay. Uh, cool. Thanks for giving me some extra context. I'm just trying to. Piece sure. I wish I could give you more, but it's uh, given my experience. Unfortunately, I, I don't have the best answers for these things. No, that's okay. Because um, I'm taking into account because I've, I mean, I, I've gotten a feel for the process of a lot of different coding boot camps from kind of just the business side of things or the the curriculum side of things and the student side. And sometimes I think, I mean, it's incredibly important that there is communication and those expectations are laid out for students because if they aren't, like your perception, like it could, you, you don't really know how to perceive your experience you don't really know the right questions to ask you don't know if you're getting your full money's worth out of the experience or you just have a really shitty cohort or you just have a really shitty instructor like it's really hard when those expectations aren't laid out um like for example like hey you know you're going to get homework assignments we're going to make sure that you're actually learning what you need to learn we're going to make sure you don't fall behind and here's how we're going to do that here's the assessments this is the kind of feedback that you're going to get and I think it's a coding bootcamp's responsibility to ask those questions, but all too often, um, this is actually kind of a common thing when staff are stretched thin, where I highly encourage students to ask those questions up front with admissions, which I understand, you know, like not everyone's going to hear my advice and they don't know what they don't know coming in, but that is my advice. Yeah. Anyone listening to it, like ask as many questions like this. Um, especially when it comes to assessments and making sure that you're going to be qualified to go to the next section and keep up with things and what happens if you fall behind. These are all really good questions to ask. Um, but, you know, it sounds like because um, you, you know, we had a casual conversation about this before and you shared that, like, it ended up being a pretty bad experience for a lot of people. Several people dropped out. So um, let's let's jump into that. Um, start talking about like uh, or share your experience with your you kind of moving to actually quit the program and things you've heard from other students with your cohort. What were they experiencing? When did they quit? How many quit? So I was very fortunate to land a junior position as a WordPress developer before all of this went down. Um, so my story is different than essentially everybody else's in, in this situation. Um, but basically what happened just to continue from the story that I, that I mentioned, our TA ended up getting replaced and the next TA that we got was fine. Uh, I suppose what you would expect from, 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 from a TA to begin with. Um, but the instructional quality because of the lack of assessments, um, promises that were made to review certain things that we were learning, not being fulfilled, et cetera, just left me in kind of a position where I was like, you know, I'm learning a lot from this job that I have currently. I'm relatively disciplined outside of work to study on my own. So I'm going to make the decision to withdraw from this cohort because I don't, because there's so many students that are behind, I don't perceive this opportunity as being really any more valuable, maybe less valuable than sticking around for group projects. Um, and yeah, so I decided to withdraw at that point. I was just expecting a, you know, GA has a condition where if you withdraw up to 40%, like at, at, at any point up to 40% of the length of the cohort, you get the difference that you've paid back. So at that point I was planning to pay in cash. I'd paid like 8k so far which was roughly half of the admissions i got like four of that back and that was that um but 
about a week and a half later, we had a very small cohort. We started off with 12 people. By the time I withdrew, there were eight or nine. And a week after I withdrew, all but two of the remaining students dropped the cohort. So th- it was it was one to one teacher to student ratio. And I think that GA made the appropriate decision at that point to shut down the cohort because it was, you know, it's financially and insol- it's a financially insolvent cohort at that point. There's no reason to keep it going when you could just shift students to the other cohort. But um, because that blew up in the way that it did, th- this was like a three, or three, three and a half, four week process. But they went through basically a process where they decided, hey, we can make an exception to our contract, which says that you only get you know up to 40% difference, et cetera, like I just explained. And we're going to be issuing full refunds to the entire cohort. The only condition that they were going to do that upon was if any student that wanted that full refund, they were requiring to sign a document which is essentially an NDA. Um, it's it's a non-disclosure, non-disparagement, uh, um, and the, I mean the story ends with all of the students ended up signing that NDA except for me. So out of twelve students, um, I'm the only student that attended that cohort that is even legally allowed to talk about this experience. Um, which I don't, I'm sure we'll hear your opinion on that, but I think it's quite shady personally. Um, and that includes leaving any reviews for the cohort online, um, et cetera. So. So I'll start. So when, okay, up to 40%. So you basically got to about 50%. You passed to 40%. So you were no longer eligible for a full refund, but with your current contract, you were still el- eligible for a, a partial refund, correct? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and that partial refund, was that a static amount or was that based on the amount of time that you spent in the program? The latter. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's really difficult. So I, I don't... So here, here's what I think about different programs, because I've heard different people demanding refunds in different situations. I, It's really hard to assess whether the cohort deserved the full refund amount without talking to the instructors and, and TAs and just staff and the feedback that they got. Um, I'd actually like to talk to the other like students and graduates, but they can't talk, right? Because they signed that contract. So... Um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of torn because they made an exception and that might not be fair. And the, the experience might've been shitty enough where they really didn't even get any value out of their first eight weeks. Like I really got to dig into that situation to figure out. Um, and so I, I, I would have to get more information to decide like what I think about that. Overall, it just sounds like the experience is shitty. Whether students deserve the full refund or not, um, and not just a partial, I don't know. So that's my honest opinion about that. But what is absolutely disgusting is all, silencing someone from ever leaving a review, right? Because this is huge with marketing. Like when you don't know, like you're spending over ten thousand dollars for this program, ten to twenty thousand, and all you can do is literally look at reviews online. If you don't yeah. know someone that went into the program, that's that's all you have, right? Yeah. And so you are spending that much money, which is not a small amount for most people, to get a holistic picture of what the program is like. You're going through all of these different r- reviews. And the, like I've, I've talked about this in many different ways. A lot of negative reviews are axed from ever becoming public. And this is one way that it can happen. But I mean, like you are essentially paying and agreeing to that amount based on all of these reviews, mostly positive for every single coding bootcamp, which is bullshit. And you are agreeing to that amount, given that expectation, when a lot of like obviously going to be negative reviews in your cohort are being snuffed out. You're not getting the whole picture. 
you're not getting the, these reviews. And regardless of like whether they deserve the full refund or not, when you legally silence people, um, how, how are you supposed to make an educated decision whether this program is actually going to be right for you um, and it's actually going to bring you to actually getting a full-time software engineering position because a lot of times you're, look at, you're looking at these reviews you're like okay what's relatable right you're trying to attach to different stories and different backgrounds oh this person came from this background or this person had anxiety this person had this this person had that it's like okay i want to get that like you, a lot of people try to relate to certain reviews and try to be like okay this is most likely gonna be me and this person had a decent experience they really liked the instructors but the instructors didn't really encourage a lot of group activities blah 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 blah. but now you get yeah. all of these negative reviews that say why they might not benefit from this program why this program might not be a good fit why they might not be able to trust the instructors the staff to be able to you know handle these types of situations efficiently because it sounds like the situation went on for a long time and so all these stories are snuffed out why should anyone trust a coding boot camp when you you don't have the whole picture and that, that's what pisses me off is just like i actually think it's a great idea to offer that full review or at least say hey do you want to jump into another cohort we'll make sure that you catch up blah 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 and you're doing everything possible to make up for that bad experience but i mean if people don't feel like they're getting it and you offer that full refund it's like even from a pr move it just seems shitty to silence people like that i just I, I honestly don't get it. it. It's just such a bad idea. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I I agree wholeheartedly, man. Um, and you know, you only hear about these silencing situations when the rare person slips yeah. through the cracks. And like, you know, I don't have money coming out of my ass. You know, I got I have two kids. We have a third on the way. Like, I got fucking bills to pay, man. So to to just to skip out on the extra four grand that in my opinion for for ga dissolving the cohort was more or less due back to me especially since it was due back to everybody else um is no small no small price to pay so uh, again i'm grateful to be on here um i have two uh, kind of two notes about what you just said if i if i may um first off you're right the students the majority of the students did not represent themselves in a way that was appropriate when things started going south um if i could give anybody advice that is planning on attending a coding boot camp in this video it would be to speak up for yourself if you're falling behind if you don't like the instructor if you think you need a different cohort it's like if you're not speaking up because you're afraid that somebody's going to see you as rude it's like throw your manners out the window in that regard because um this is your education you're paying in six months what people typically pay for a year of university instruction which is i think is quite overpriced as well that's for a different podcast but um like if you're going to make the decision to spend this much money you 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 have to have the the uh the uh, what's the uh, the guts i guess that's the appropriate term for it to like speak up if something feels bad and trust your gut feeling and and make sure that it's heard and yeah it was drawn out far too long i mean from the point that myself and another student kind of realized like hey this is this is not good we should do something about this to like me dropping was like five weeks it was like it was way too long um so yeah and then sweeping people under the rug so they can't speak it's it's sad man because the only indicator that you're going to get if people can't leave reviews that that a boot camp is is doing poorly is the potential eventual bankruptcy of that organization because they can't hold things together and you know or something similar to that or like lawsuits um and by the time that's happened far too many people have paid the price in terms of lost time lost wages lost tuition uh, the list goes on but yeah the damage that doing uh, the damage that that practice leaves in its wake is incalculable 
especially when you're dealing with people who like i just need to take a second to speak up for the people that dropped man like these are moms that are staying at home and watching their kids full time in addition to going to school these are people that quit their jobs because they had faith that ga would like give them something reasonable that they would be able to get into tech um these people had shit on the line uh they they had stakes when they joined this and um the fact that they can't even talk about like how poor of an experience this was and i get it like bad experiences are going to happen with boot camps i'm not like i'm not mad at ga because one of their cohorts fell apart um but to to put them in a situation where they can't even talk about it is just like the, you got to answer for that eventually that's the part that's disgusting um i've see i i hear different stories of like kind of predatory contracts or contracts that are just i mean they just scare people like you don't have a lot of money you're not an attorney and you see this legalese that um especially like with a lot of refund policies you'll get this legalese that it, it's basically just a non-disparagement clause where you're allowed that refund um as long as you don't say anything bad about the program i i truly don't understand that practice it feels like it comes from a place of fear and a lack of confidence in your own program so if there was like you know if they had a couple of students that like didn't try they didn't put effort forth and now these students are complaining oh yeah you know ta instructor didn't help me blah blah blah. and there's another yeah. story to it that's different and then th th these individuals are like okay you know what we want to refund or we're going to just you know shit on your program i'm going to say tell everyone how bad this program is right that's a situation where I, I mean i would quite frankly just say ga give them the middle finger like there are bad yeah. attitudes and bad actors like that but to have this um to basically have this broad policy when you're issuing refunds like that shows just fear and a lack of confidence in the quality of your program or the quality of your instructors and that to me is a red flag right it, it, i feel like it says a lot more and i i'm very curious who decided to just implement this policy who decided this was a good idea and i mean ga isn't the only program um, i'm not going to list off any coding boot camps because like the, the goal isn't just to shit on specific coding boot camps i don't want to get any names yeah. wrong either um but it just i, I don't know it, it, i think that's one of the most disgusting things about the coding boot camp industry is people don't feel like they have uh an educate they, they're not informed they don't have all of the reviews they don't have all of the stories they just see statistics that don't really dive into the details of like all this job placement like a lot of data is just presented in a way that excludes certain variables that are actually relevant you would think are obviously included in the data and they're not but like it's not just reviews it's the way uh placement rates are even presented it's the way admissions sell the program it's like it just I think a lot of people just feel like it's a big sales funnel all the time and stuff like this when you hear these like hidden contracts silencing people from even being able to share their story and i actually think if they let people share their story it'd be a little bit better than they think it would be when you offer a full freaking refund that's huge right and you actually got a little bit of education i would argue like eight weeks in you are getting an outline of what needs to come like you're yeah you might not even need to go to a coding boot camp now oh, okay i have an outline now i could supplement like that you might have set yeah. them up for success right and maybe you yeah. don't offer the full refund maybe you like charge them a thousand or something like that it's like you can work in something but um i just i i, I feel like when you just I don't, when you silence people it's like this is why people don't trust the coding boot camp industry yeah. um I, I do feel sad for your cohort. I, I truly do, because it sounds like a lot of them, you know, they quit their jobs. And, you know, once you quit your job, too, it's it's hard to get that job back, you know? Yeah, dude, especially now. Even if you now. get that full refund. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. I, um, I, I mean, I, I come from a sales background, so I don't blame the, you know, any... Uh, whenever you're selling a big ticket item like this kind of education you you have to have some kind of a funnel so i don't blame them inherently for for setting things up the way that they do but yeah um 
you I, you wouldn't think it would be that hard to set up like a, a WSU policy, a we screwed up policy, um, where it's like, you know, if it's the fault, if it's deemed to be the fault of, of, uh, of the boot camp, um, there are processes in place to take care of that and do damage mitigation while still being honest. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, man, I mean, I've, I've talked to a few people since this all went down that have worked and do work in the coding bootcamp space. And I mean, generally speaking, the thing that I hear the most is that um, we should be expecting, hopefully in in an ideal world to see more regulation come into the coding bootcamp world, um, because this is no small, th this is no small industry. Uh, I mean, GA was acquired in 2018 for $412 million. It's not exactly chump change that we're working with here. Um, so when you have an enterprise that's this big, that's doing things like this, like I'm not a lawyer. Um, I, I, I have a reasonable moral compass though. And I can tell you just from how this feels that this isn't the right way to do business. So, um, yeah, we'll see. I, I, I would, I would say probably that would be a good thing to have more regulation in an industry like this, similar to how it is in actual education. Um, but I suppose we'll, I suppose we'll see if that happens and if that ends up being a good thing, but it certainly would be a step in a direction. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you'll get you'll get regulation in some states. Like, I think California is a big one that protects students. Um, yeah. But yeah, to, to get something that's going to be spread across multiple states, you're just you're in the wrong country for that. Um, that's not how sure. our country operates. And that, you know, that is there, there are pros and cons to this setup. But um, you might even consider, uh, honestly, like if you really do especially when you sign an isa especially when you sign a contract that puts you a little bit at a financial uh risk or that you're going to be owing a lot of money i feel like maybe you lean on like look into the state that the coding boot camp is in and try to lean on a little bit heavier regulation uh you might be paying a lot more for that as well unfortunately because sure. you get a lot of the bigger programs in states like this but yeah, the coding bootcamp is is weird. I don't think we're going to get regulation anytime soon. And I think until uh, alternative education starts getting taken a little bit more seriously, that regulation is not going to come because you don't really get any government aid. It, it'd be nice to see like government financial aid for alternative education rather than dumping and like getting $100,000 in debt with, you know, a CS degree necessarily sure. when you truly can't afford that. But it, yeah, it's it's a weird situation. I think a lot of coding boot camps are just going to start dropping, to be honest, if this market keeps up. But we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly will. Yeah. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 wild, man. It's, it's quite the situation. This is not what I was expecting when I when I signed up. That's yeah. for sure. But I well, and I, I really appreciate you sharing this story because you're the only one in your cohort who apparently can. Um, right? Yeah, man. So I'm one of 12. So I mean, uh, at least count me for like, you can know if you look at at uh, what is it course report? Uh, is that the website? If you if you look at a review website, and you're looking at GA, I would say at a minimum, count for 12 negative reviews that you don't see on there and you you do the implications to figure out if this might have happened before i think we know the answer but um yeah i think this is a interesting approach uh that is probably more common than uh, most people anticipate i think so too did you leave a negative review I have not. I've been posting regularly to my YouTube about it. I just haven't gotten around to uh, to, to leaving a review myself. So I need to get my $4,000 worth and get that thing out there. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. 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 It cost a lot of money. So yeah. this sounds like a really shitty experience. I'd be really curious. So if any uh, GA students, uh, you know, you're watching this or any other students from different coding boot camps, like the, the problem is there are people that will reach out to me and try to be anonymous and they don't really want to speak up. Even if they didn't sign yeah. a contract that would put them at legal risk, people just don't want to put their yeah. face out there. So please like this, this happens all the time. And I'm just kind of yelling into the wind when you're trying to get me to share your anonymous stories. A lot of people just think I have it out for the coding boot camp. The number of times I've been accused of that, it's just like, just come out of the podcast. Like, please, like, because yours, yeah. I guarantee your story isn't a, a solo story. There are so many other out there, other stories yeah. out there. I agree. And I, I, did, I did want to make sure that I took a minute to say, like, I, I have a similar experience on, you know, my, my, 
channel is much smaller than yours at this point, but I have a similar experience where like my comments are filled with uh, boot camp uh, pessimists, let's put it. And um, <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to make a note, like I am not anti-coding boot camp. I think that um, a good percentage of coding boot camps are set up in a reasonable way and they produce reasonable results for people who put in a lot of work. Um, and I think it's a viable option for a ton of people. I wouldn't generally say, don't go to a coding boot camp. I don't think that's the right answer. Um, I don't have the right answer though. Uh, the right answer is there are good boot camps out there and there are bad boot camps out there. Um, I think that uh, I think that this needs to be talked about more just in this space in general, uh, how to evaluate a, co a coding bootcamp properly, um, who you should be talking to, what questions you should be asking them. Um, there's, there's so much more due diligence that needs to go into this because it is a sales funnel. Ultimately, you go to a coding bootcamps website, it's a sales funnel. There's like some exceptions, um, to where they very much so like force you to consider the implications of joining. But in any case, I, I to avoid rambling, I'll, I'll stop at that. But, um, I'm, yeah, I appreciate you having me on to have this discussion because these talks need to be happening, happening more often. We need to be asking these questions of what makes a good coding bootcamp, what you need to be talking about with admissions and other students and the teachers and people who got fired or quit from that bootcamp. And there's, there's much more information you need than just the single track of that particular coding bootcamp's sales funnel. So I agree. I appreciate the kind of the advice and the opinion. I'm on, I have the same opinion that um, coding boot camps are definitely still a very viable option. Um, and I think they should be considered. I'm a big, uh, I give, I, I give a lot of strong advice on like, just read the contract, know exactly what you're getting into, read it thoroughly. Yeah. And if you don't understand it, um, like talk to an attorney and I know an attorney costs, but so does that coding boot camp. Um, yeah. And so you're, you're making a huge investment, but I, I, so I have one final question for you. I'm going to challenge you a bit. Um, if you could go back and um, talk to admissions again, before you signed up to this program, what are three questions you would ask admissions to assess whether this is going to happen or not? So one question that I did ask was if I could talk to alumni of, uh, you know, if they had people that, that on a short list, essentially, that I could talk to. I talked to two alumni of GA before going. I would talk to more. And I would also skirt around the admissions to do that as well. I would just be reaching out on LinkedIn, uh, similar to how I am now or how people are now reaching out to me. Um, so that's, that's number one. I kind of cheated because I did ask that. Um, getting a, let's see, I would generally ask questions that would give me a better idea of what it would look like if things were not going well. So try to figure out what kind of actions they take if say you're falling behind. Um, and, and, and then like something like that, you would be able to kind of test that. So if you are falling behind and you're not being held to those standards, or if other students are falling behind and they're not being held to that standard, you would know that something might be up. Now, again, that's not going to really tell you if there are red flags until you're in the experience. Um, I think the third thing that I would ask and look out for is the thoroughness of their qualification process. Um, like there was pre-work for GA, but the pre-work was essentially like following a Udemy course, more or less. It was very, it was, it was not extremely rigorous. If, if you like paid any attention, essentially you could, you could do decently on it. Um, and I don't even know if all the students completed their pre-work either beforehand. So that's another thing. Um, but pay attention to how hard it is to get into the boot camp because I, I don't know if you have this opinion, uh, as well, but, uh, a coding bootcamp that is rigorous is going to filter out a ton of people before they even get to day one through the pre-assessment, through the pre-work. Um, so make sure that that exists for the school. 
make sure it's rigorous. It should not be easy to get through unless you've spent six, nine months self-studying beforehand, which which was the case for me. The pre-work was essentially all review for me, as was the first half of the first module. But um, yeah, those were um, for 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 just being asked like point blank like that. That's what I would say. Um, make sure you're formulating questions that will be good indicators down the line um, and do a better job than me at coming up with questions you can ask to figure out if it's a good uh, cohort to go to in the first place. Sorry, my battery just died on my camera. <laughs> That's okay. I'll keep talking while you... Uh, are you replacing sure. it? I am. Yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. Can you still hear me? I can. I can hear you just fine. Sorry, Don. Awesome. You're fine. So I'll respond to that. Um, essentially, like, first two points... Uh, yeah, the first two points are really good, and I love the idea of, so I, I'm a big proponent of, if you're going to sign up for a coding boot camp, go with one with a rigorous assessment, and um, the, the one thing I'll add on to it, because I know the argument against it, it's like, that means the coding boot camp isn't accessible, right? It allows, so people that have a little bit of a lower education, et cetera, aren't able to get in and it gatekeeps people out of the coding boot camp. So I already yeah. know that's the big argument against it. And I, I say that's bullshit because just because you make it into the program doesn't mean you're going to get your money's worth out of it. And when you don't already, you're not in a good financial situation already to be shoved through a program like this and not be able to get the most out of it. You are just burning money at that point. So yeah. I, I highly recommend if people want to consider a coding boot camp, do the self-taught path for a few months. Talk to admissions. If you have a favorite coding boot camp, talk to admissions. What can I do to prepare to be the best student that I possibly can be? How can I prepare for this assessment? Blah, blah, blah. Spend a little time. Become resourceful. Get curious about coding, right? A lot of people just want to sh run through the coding boot camp and expect to get a job uh, right afterwards anyways. And that's an extremely rare circumstance to have happened. And so I find that a lot of people become really successful when they start enjoying coding. They dive into it. They figure out if they even want to do it because that's going to help, you know, fuel that fire throughout the entire program. You're going to spend a little extra time each night um, on the program and you're going to get your money's worth. So even if you fail the assessment, because it is rigorous, which is a good thing because they're making yeah. sure everyone's ready, um, you just do it again. They have another cohort coming up, et cetera, which is why you shouldn't just quit your job right away. I like I'm a big proponent as well. It's like you know, like you probably shouldn't just quit your job. I think a lot more people should consider part-time programs and doing it on the side, given the market and, you know, understand your financial situation. If that's what you need to do, that's what you need to do. And for people that are quitting full-time, just make sure you're spending a good amount of time just studying on your own, preparing as much as you can, because that rigorous assessment, that is the one component of a coding boot camp that I find that guarantees a job placement. It's making sure that student is ready. Um, so I a hundred percent agree with that, but yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, man. I, I'll, I'll say one more thing and I, I won't keep you all day. I know you have, you have a life just like I do, but, um, I, I, I'm not like, uh, I don't believe like in superiority complexes when it comes to becoming a developer. I think that basically anybody that really wants to can, um, not everybody is ready right now. You might not be ready right now. And there should be a filter to determine, to determine whether or not you're ready to do it right now. And if you're not, that's totally okay. This isn't the bar exam where if you, you know, fail a handful of times, you're, you're barred uh, from ever doing it again. So there's that. And uh, just to like quickly make a note on what you said about, you know, quitting your job and getting a job in six months. That happens with a very small amount of people. And I would say that betting the farm on that is ultimately an insult to yourself because it downplays the legitimacy of the career change that you're trying to make in the first place. Like you can get a lot of jobs in six months. Most of them are going to be shitty jobs that you don't want to stay in. So like I, if this is my advice that you're, you haven't said it, maybe your advice too, but like treat this as if you were going to medical school or you were going to school to become an attorney because you can make the same amount as both of those after after a, a decent amount of time but like to to downplay it and say like yeah i'm going to make this work in 6 months um doesn't hold it to the same like 
high standard that it can potentially be. So, yeah, I, I like that perspective, and it's it's showing respect towards what you're becoming. Because as a software engineer, generally software engineers, especially in tech companies, are highly respected, high responsibility, um, and they can literally destroy the entire company. Um, given that you hire like really shitty team of software engineers, so yes. uh, yeah, no, it's it's harder to become than people think, and that's okay. And you financially prepare for that. You allow yourself more time for information to sink in because I think a lot of people sell it as this really easy transition and yeah. it's not. It just isn't. And then people poorly plan around that and that's what gets them. So I, yeah, I think that was good advice. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. So that's pretty much the conversation I wanted to have. Uh, Colby, seriously, I, I really appreciate you coming on. And if any GA staff are watching this, um, I'm happy to bring you on. You want to talk about the what happened with this cohort? Uh, I'm happy to hear your side of things. I definitely have questions, uh, but I do like, you know, hopefully it. Uh, I made it clear. I like getting both perspectives. I like getting the business side of things, and I get like getting the student side of things. So if you have something to say about this, um, just reach out. Just email me, um, and I'm happy to talk. But Colby, uh, stick around for a couple of minutes. But seriously, man, thank you so much for coming back on. Thank you, Don. As always, I appreciate it, man. Believe. 